Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Open Data Institute. My name is Anna Scott. I'm the editor here, and I'm delighted to introduce Catherine Durden and Rachel Rank today from 360 Giving to talk about transforming charitable giving with open data. So first, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you are watching online and like, would like to participate in the conversation, you can use the hashtag ODI Fridays. If you have any questions, you can use the hashtag as well, and we'll be sure to ask them at the end. Um, and I will hand over now to Rachel and Catherine. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. Uh, as Anna said, my name's Rachel. <coughs> I run 360 Giving. Um, for those of you who haven't heard us, we are a relatively new initiative established in 2015. Um, and uh, our ultimate goal is to use more open data for effective grant making. Um, we're really looking forward to sharing our progress with you today, but also talking about lessons learned. And I'm really keen to hear from you. So please do ask me lots of questions. Um, I mean, just to give you a bit of background, there are, there are three core focus areas for us. We work primarily, we're working with organizations to help them publish their grants data openly to a, a standard that we've developed. Um, and we're developing tools and platforms that use that data. And then the third, but perhaps most important goal is using that data for more informed decision making and learning. So what do we do? Uh, at the moment, you know, as I said, we're a fairly new initiative, so we're very much focused on getting open, comparable, standardized data from grant makers um, and helping them to use that data as part of a more innovative and informed approach to grant making. Um, there's three core components to what we do. There's outreach and engagement, which is led by my colleague Catherine, who you'll be hearing from shortly. Um, and we support organizations with the publication and, and use of that data using the standard that we've developed. And then we're looking at innovation and use, and particularly so we know that both the data is useful and used. So we're not, we're not a transparency initiative in that sense. We're about um, encouraging people to, to use the data and tell us what is and isn't working and what more they'd like to see. As part of that, we've got a tech team that support us. So we provide pro bono support to organizations to help them publish their data. There's no fees or charges associated with what we do. We're not, we don't have a membership model in that sense. So. Why does this matter? Why UK grant making? This um, table is taken from um, the 2015 Giving Trends Report, which was produced by the Association for Charitable Foundations. Um, and it just shows you the spaghetti junction of grant making in the UK. So in 2014, 2015, there was six billion pounds worth of grants provided. And you can just see here in this chart how that all comes together. At the moment, there is no way of mapping all those flows. But we know that lots of those organizations are supporting the same sectors and regions, the same organizations. But there's no way of mapping that across. Um, so you know, that makes it difficult for grant makers to get their data for decision making and ch check their added impact. But it also is really time consuming for fundraisers to find out who funds what, where, and if they're eligible or not. And that's time wasted for them. And we feel really strongly that this could be done more efficiently. Um, and we know it's possible. We know that there are now you know, ways of sharing data and information. I don't have to tell you as an audience here today that the, the technology is there. So for us, it's about making it happen and showing the potential around being able to open up this data and what that could mean for, for the different end users. So, as I said, it's, it's more than just opening up and, and transparency for transparency's sake, but it's the idea of having standardized data. So you're comparing apples with apples. And I really like this plug analogy. I'm sure you've all traveled to other countries and had that problem with you've not brought the right converter for the plug. It's really irritating. You can't, you can't plug in. And it's just this idea that lots of organizations, they may be publishing their grants data on their websites or in PDFs and their own reports or on a database. But to get all that information in one place, you'd have to do a lot of data manipulation and scraping at the moment. If you could just plug in by using a standard, that would save you the majority of the work at the moment would be spent on, on data cleaning. And there are lots of initiatives that have inspired us that might be familiar to you. Um, primarily the International Age Transparency Initiative that I was very involved with for several years, where we've now got over 300 organizations publishing aid data to a standard format. 
Um, and, and other apps like the Transport for London app um, and Fix My Street and uh, Open Contracting as well actually has inspired us. This idea that um, actually it is possible to bring organisations together to share open data and, and see uses of that. And, and we felt that there was a, a gap with UK grant making that um, could build on these initiatives and, and their learning as well. So, uh, what have we got at the moment in term, terms of current grant spend published as data? The government is the biggest single grant maker in the UK, and by government I mean central and local government, local authorities, and non-departmental public bodies, so Arts Council, Sports England, people like that. Um, so far, we've got over £8 billion pounds worth of grants published the 360 giving standard. But as you can see, there's a long way to go to get some of these missing figures to the point where we could build things like this. And this, for me, is our kind of end goal, that you could get this data at a few clicks of a button. So at the moment, you wouldn't be able to find out who's given grants to coastal communities or children and young people or local sports activities. But we want to get to a point where you don't even know that there's a data standard driving this stuff. You just know that you can search for this information and get really high quality data to find out who's funding what where. And, and we know this is technically possible. We've got 32 different grant makers publishing their data at the moment. Um, and those range from the big lottery that's published all its grants since 2004 to some really small local grant makers like community foundations or Trafford Council. So we've, we've got a mix, but for us it's about just pushing ahead and getting more of that data. Given the audience, um, I think it's probably worth handing over to my colleague Catherine a bit to talk about the standard and the detail around that and what we've developed and why and the kind of information items we're looking for. So Catherine, if I hand over to you and you can talk a bit more about the detail around that. Yes, thank you. So um, the 360 Giving Standard that we've developed, um, it's been kept simple, although it has great scope to explain lots of different aspects of grant making. So you can talk about the grant itself, describe it, um, have a title, but you can also talk about when it happened and describe your organisation as a funder or the recipient organisation uh, who's received it. Uh, you can also talk about where the grant went in terms of the location of the charity, but also you can talk about where the project happened. And this is a big uh, uh, um, challenge and, and the kind of information that people really want to know, not just where a charity is based, but also where who benefited which areas. Um, it's also possible to talk about programmes, classifications, and you can also link to supporting documents. So there's scope for organisations to link to um, uh, impact reports if they wanted to. Um, we've kept it simple though, so it's actually publishing via a spreadsheet. Um, we thought that anything more complicated would uh, get in the way of uh, organisations getting involved. Uh, we want the bar to entry to be very low, but people to, to get involved and then learn and uh, publish and republish and sort of grow and build their capacity through that. That was a key learning from the IATI uh, initiative that um, organisations struggled to publish using XML. Uh, and then so we developed an, uh, an option for publishers to publish via a spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, so there's really great scope in the standard to describe lots of different activities, many different fields. But in order to comply with our standard, in order for it to be valid, you only need 10 fields. And that is another way that we've kept it simple. Um, it's a way of identifying the grant, so it's you know, uniquely identified as that grant makers. Uh, also, um, you know, talking about the, the, the grant itself, how, what kind of currency it was awarded in, the amount, and also talking about the organisation that gave the data um, and also the, the organisation that, that received the, the grant. So, uh, you know, this is very simple and, and it's something that we, we understand that, that organisations can get involved in. It also aligns nicely with things like the Local Authority Transparency Code, which is um, the way that local authorities are obliged to uh, report data about their grant making to, to charities. Um, so, um, I mean, in, in showing this kind of information, uh, it's flexible, so you can uh, use it to tell your own grant-making story. Um, and uh, what we've also done is, is uh, develop tools that help people to publish and, and check the data so that it's not too laborious a process. So, um, 
Uh, like I said, it's, it's literally publishing via a spreadsheet. Um, so, you know, it's uh, something that's available on each of the different publishers' websites. So uh, people don't give the, uh, the, the data to us and report it. They, um, they prepare it. We support them with that process of preparing it, um, help them tell the story they want to about their grant making using data. But then it's hosted on their site. It's licensed on their site. And uh, they have control over it if they want to make changes, updates. Um, the, the, the standard itself is in JSON, but what we've done is created a method by which uh, you can uh, publish via <coughs> spreadsheet and it can convert uh, to a more sort of technical uh, uh, version. So, we, you know, is it possible? We've got the 32 organisations publishing. Uh, it's like the Big Lottery Fund, one of the UK's largest grant makers. Um, also, uh, small uh, charities like Zing, which gives uh, grants internationally. MAC, which is a voluntary sector organisation um, that also gives grants in Greater Manchester, Comic Relief, <coughs> BBC Children Need. So we've got good scope in terms of the UK, but also um, some very specialist and kind of local grant makers. Uh, and it's growing all the time. So um, we've built a registry where, so although this data is spread around on each uh, organisation's website, we um, have a place on our website where all of the data is available for people to look at and download. Uh, and um, as you know, part of this, we're now also building the tools to help with the quality of the data and also building tools on the back of the data that we have. Um, one of the things that we're doing in the coming year is having data use pilots to make sure the data is uh, useful and used and working with communities on that. Uh, looking at specific regions. Uh, we've literally just launched uh, a data use pilot focusing on Greater Manchester. So we're looking for people to get involved in that, who care about what's happening in Greater Manchester and, and want to get involved. Um, uh, so in the data set, there's lots of different um, bits of information. I've previously done analysis about what's happening in London. Um, it's maybe a bit uh, complicated to go through here, but basically we're taking the data that's in the data set and compare it with NCVO's um, details about where charities are located in London and looking at where uh, there's information about beneficiary for the grants. So um, uh, what we tend, we founded with this bit of uh, quick and dirty analysis is that um, although somewhere like London gets lots of money, the question is how many of uh, the recipients uh, of the grant are actually benefiting London versus uh, being given to somewhere else in the country. So we did some analysis to look at it and um, roughly speaking what you find out is that the larger the charity is based in London, uh, the less likely it is that that grant was to benefit London itself. The smaller charities, it was a much more high, high likelihood of that. Again, it's sort of quick and dirty data based on one year's worth of Charity Commission data compared with the grants data that we have. But it, it points to something that, that um, is interesting and certainly merits further analysis. Um, uh, so other people are using the data. Uh, this is a map uh, created by Bath Hacked. Uh, they're a voluntary uh, open data group um, in Bath and they took some data from GrantNav, which is one of our tools, which has 36 giving data and use a free mapping tool to build a map of where grants had gone to Bath and North East Somerset. So, you know, this, it's not uh, particularly analysing those grants, but it is showing what's happening. And it points to the fact that there are lots of different uses and we didn't know this was happening. They didn't come to us to ask permission because it's open data. We found about it, out it, about it via Twitter. So this is the kind of stuff we love. We love to find out after the fact that people are using it because that means that it's useful and people are interested in it. Um, other uses for the data, so NCVO have used it in research and NICFA in Northern Ireland as well. Um, we fundraisers uh, are using it uh, individually to, to do searching but also consultancies and uh, Beehive is um, a, a great uh, project that, that we're supporting which is taking 360 get, giving data along with other data sets to create profiles of uh, grant makers and matching them with uh, 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 charities to try and um, create better matches and uh, cut down the time wasted in fundraising. And we've got David, who's from Beehive, in the audience. So maybe later on, if there's questions about that, we can talk a bit more about it. Um, one of the things that we did is once we had enough data, you know, eight billion pounds worth of grants from lots of different funders, we were able to build our own tool to explore the data set. Uh, not many people are motivated to go to uh, 20 
seven different spreadsheets around the internet to, to download it. Uh, and so what we've done is put a front end on it, and this is Grant Nav. So if anyone's got a device with them, wants to have a look, you can search for all sorts of things in Grant Nav. You can look by keyword. If that word is in the data anywhere, it will look for it. But you can also filter. Um, we built it a bit like Booking.com or TripAdvisor to say, you know, you start with a big search and then you narrow down by place, by district, by year, by amounts, uh, by the kind, the, which funder. And so if you go and have a play around with it, um, uh, hopefully you find something interesting. But also at any point, if you find something interesting, you can download it. So it also supplies the 360 giving data or a version of it for people to take away, like those people who made the map. So um, yeah, really please you know, uh, try out Grant, Grant Naf. Let us know what you think. Um, as more people publish, more data goes into it, so it grows in, in its value. Um, Beehive Giving, which I mentioned, um, this was a sort of prototype map that looked at um, m matching data uh, from 360 Giving and other data sources to create profiles and, and ideas of uh, where things are happening. And uh, that's, that's, that's something that we're very excited about, the, the possibility of this data supporting uh, fundraisers, uh, grant seekers uh, in, in their work, making it easier for them to find the right kinds of um, sources so they don't waste time going and applying for people who just won't fund them. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Rachel now to talk about what we've learnt from our campaign so far. Thank you. <coughs> so what have we learned? Quite a lot. Primarily we've learnt that grant makers are quite low tech. Um, that means they need quite a lot of help with publishing. They need to understand what open data is. Um, they need to understand their data protection issues. They need to be told why you need to have certain licenses on data. Um, all the things that I expect a lot of you take for granted, a lot of this is very new for them. Um, not all of them, but some of them, you know, they are small organisations with small staff teams um, running, you know, private charitable trusts and foundations. And some of this stuff can be a little bit scary for them if it's the first time they've done it before. And they're already inundated with applications and there's something about us just helping walk them through the publishing process and keeping it very simple and easy and giving them the tech support they need um, and just making sure that they don't feel overwhelmed by the process. And I think the big learning there is we, we say to them, start with publishing what you can. Don't wait for this perfect data world. It doesn't exist. You know, start with maybe your last quarter's grants or your last year's grants. You own your data. You're not giving us data to do magic things to, and then people will be scrutinising it, and you will be inundated with applications. Uh, they put the data on their website. As Catherine said, they put it on a URL on their website. They decide how often they, they renew it, how frequently, depending on their grant-making cycles. So if they're doing rolling grants, they might publish monthly. Others might publish once a year because they only grant once a year. So it's very much um, taking them through that process and making sure that they don't confuse this with a transparency exercise. So lots of them will say to us, well, we already publish all our grants on our website. And we look at that PDF and we politely tell them why. That's a nice thing, but it's, you know, that's great for transparency. But who can use that data? And then that leads to a conversation about, about data use and what information they would like as grant makers. So I think it makes it a bit more real to them getting beyond this kind of checkbox transparency exercise. Um, and I think, I think, uh, I mean, linking to that, 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 that next learning, show, don't tell, we can talk a lot to grant makers about, you know, why it's important to do certain things. But unless you show them that potential, it sometimes is a bit too um, theoretical, I think, for some of them. So we have found that um, talking to them about organisation identifiers, often you lose people a bit in that conversation. But if we can show them on grant nav, for example, if you want to compare grants to the same charity, you would need to collect that charity number or a company number to compare all the funding to that organisation. Suddenly, you can see the, the penny drop and they get it. And you know, actually, yeah, we are collecting that data or we're going to start collecting organisation identifiers so that you can do that. And, and, and suddenly, I think then you make it more real to see you know, use of the data. Um, and actually, we're very proud of Grant Nav. I mean, we launched that last September, and in, until that point, um, it wasn't possible to get an open comparable data set on grants made in the UK. And, and I think that really was a help with kind of a tipping point 
showing to grant makers the potential around data. They, they know they want to use more data, but sometimes they struggle to think how they want to use it. Um, and I think also, you know, linked to that is we're not just here to serve grant makers. We're also here to serve other end users of the data. So there's people like you who want to use open data. There are fund seekers. They're telling us that this stuff is gold dust for them. The amount of time they spend trying to find out who funds what, where, whether they're eligible. Actually, when we show them things like beehive giving, they absolutely love it. Because it's, I mean, I think of it as a, an online dating site almost where you get the, the best match based on your organisation based on some kind of key information items that you give them about your eligibility. So we are also very keen to get other different end users of the data, um, and that includes researchers, people looking at the sector as a whole, you know, the government, as I said, the biggest grant maker, but also journalists and, and others. And then the third big thing is, you know, we're a new initiative, and I think we have to be very honest about what is and isn't working, and there are some common issues that are coming up faced by publishers and as I mentioned earlier, organisation identifiers is one of them. Um, so as an example, you know, how do we identify grants to St Mary's School? St Mary's School is not a registered charity, it's not a registered company. There are lots of St Mary's Schools. That is causing us a bit of a problem. Or where you have, um, say, certain organisations that use one company or charity number, but they have several arms to them. Um, so things like the British Legion, they're all over the UK, but they might use one, one organisation identifier. So we, we are looking at how to deal with things like that. Um, but there, you know, there, there is some thinking and some learning that we need to put into that. And we'd love to talk about that more with anyone here who's interested. The other thing is how to deal with grants to individuals. So um, <clears throat> there are some grant makers that are maybe funding academics in universities. And they want to publish those grants, but it contains salary information. So they may have zeroed out that amount. So they're, they're being very good in that they still want to publish the information and say we're supporting this work in this university, but then it has a zero value. And, and then we're getting questions about why some of this information has zero values. So again, <clears throat> it's kind of that trade-off between wanting to be as open as possible versus personal data and, <clears throat> and how you might present some of that information. And then the other big issue we're facing, which Catherine touched on with her London analysis, is grantee versus beneficiary. So at the moment, if you were to look at the data set, there's an awful lot of money going to North London, but that's because there's lots of UK-wide charities registered in North London. The end beneficiaries you know, are UK-wide or might actually be in Newcastle or Scotland or somewhere else. And it's about how do we convey that in a meaningful way and actually maps, maps can cause us problems. There are lots of people interested in maps, but actually at the moment, if you were to map 360 data, you'd have a lot going to London. So it's, it's kind of how do you how do you visualise some of that information versus what we know is actually in the data set. So in terms of next steps, I mean, the obvious one, we need more data. We've got 31 publishers. We had a very exciting um, update actually on Tuesday. DCMS have published their grant data, some of their grant data to the 360 standard. There is a problem with um, the dates which they're working on at the moment. So we hope that will go up on the registry soon once that's fixed. But it's really exciting for us because we've got some central government grants data. Um, and we need more data from more different kinds of funders. We're working with the community foundations at the moment on a pilot to see if we can develop an app that allows them to publish automatically from their grants management system. Um, so for us, it's just that that push of getting more data. We've set ourselves a moonshot goal of getting 80% of UK grants published by 2020. Come and ask me in mid-1919 how we're doing with that. It's quite ambitious, but I think for us it's just it's important to show that anyone, anyone can publish. It's a, it's a big tent. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a big or small grant maker. Um, the second thing is we need, we need more tools. We've, as I said, we've got the GrantNav platform, we've got Beehive Giving, um, which are for two different kinds of audiences, but we want more tools and we want um, people to use that data more and tell us why it isn't, isn't good for them or how it works or not. So we don't always want to be the people commissioning and driving the development of those tools also, because obviously we come with ideas on how we think it should be used, but we want other people to tell us as well. So we're going to set up a challenge fund later this year with some small pots of money to encourage um, development of other tools that we might not think of um, to, to get people to use the data. And for us, I think that also has a knock-on effect, kind of this virtuous cycle of publish, use, improve. I think if, if, 
if publishers see more people using the data in different ways, they will be more of an incentive for them to publish more frequently and keep that cycle going. I um, mean, again, when, before we launched the GrantNav platform, some organisations had only published once, and then they saw their data on GrantNav and were like, well, this is all out of date. Where's our most recent data? To which we would say, have you published it? And suddenly they would, they would do it. So it's, it's about incentivising them as well. Um, and then linked to that, we also want to run more data use pilots. So as Catherine mentioned, we've started um, one this month in Greater Manchester, um, but we're also looking to do um, a couple more each year for the next two to three years because we want to look at uh, funding to certain sectors, regions or cities um, and just see what we can find and to bring people together. At the moment, we've got quite a spread of different kinds of grant makers, but actually... You know, in Greater Manchester, if you could get the 11, 11 local authorities there to all publish their data, their grants data in a standard format, I think that would be quite interesting to see how that breaks out across Greater Manchester, across the local authorities. So for us, again, it's about bringing, bringing groups together. Uh, and then it's, you know, different stakeholders using the data. People like you, how would you use it? We're really keen to hear how it's useful for your work. So again, we want different people to ask different questions of the data what your current constraints and frustrations are, how it supports your work, but also why it doesn't work. And, and we're very keen to collaborate on that and, and look at testing the data. So please do come and tell us what you think is good and bad about it, what more you'd like to see, and who else you think we should be speaking to. So I'm very much looking forward to some questions. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to kick us off with a question yeah. um, myself. So you. You showed us logos and sort of gave us an overview of the kinds of organisations yeah. that have published. Um, it seems that they, they come in all shapes and sizes. Is there a particular theme that you've noticed in terms of motivations or ability or sort of how, how they're geared to publish? Yeah, good question. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think um, we've tended to see the larger funders. So you can see some of the logos. This is not all of them, but this is just a selection. But some of the logos, you'll see these. Some of these are the major grant makers in the UK, major charitable grant makers in the UK. That, that is um, not a coincidence. We, have, we are trying to pick people off by size, because for us, if you don't have big lottery, comet relief, and children in need grants published openly, then you're missing three huge chunks. But also, they, as, as major grant makers, are often doing quite meaningful things with their data already and making sure they're spending UK-wide. You know, the big lottery is used to having um, questions in PMQs about what's being spent in my ward. So they, are, they are very tech-savvy and data-driven organisations already. So for them, it's not always such a big stretch to publish. Um, for others, it's a case of having, I'm sure this will resonate with some of you, it's a case of having one individual in the organisation who really cares about this. So Trafford Council is a great example. They are one of the 11 local authorities in Greater Manchester. And they've, they've published, they were the first council to publish. And that was just a case of one person there who was very aware of their requirements under the, the local government transparency code where they have to publish every spend item over 500 pounds. And he said um, that using the 360 standards just made it easier for him to do that. And it was a, was a conduit for them to meet that requirement under the local government transparency code. Oxford Community Foundation, again, there's just an enthusiastic person there who would really like to know what else is going on in Oxford and is very keen for us to speak with the council. So it does, it does vary, but it often comes down to having an individual champion. And the bigger organisations, it's definitely because they have more staff capacity and are more data-driven. Um, but I, mean, I think for us, there is something about not only going for the biggest publishers in future, but there's something about getting local authorities more on board because I think everyone's interested in what's going on locally and grassroots and so community foundations and local authorities for us are, are key to that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, quite a few. Um, I'll start over here. It's okay. If you could wait for the mic, that would be great. Hi, uh, thank you for that. It was very good and very useful. Um, it was, um, because you said that you're curious to know how users are currently you know, using your data and uh, how they're uh, where they're coming from or what purposes. Have you set out like any analytics on um, on your tools or the website uh, to collect that data from the users or how they behave? Um, Ooh, yeah. Is that something that you maybe want to consider? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm going to part answer it, then I might ask Catherine to part answer the rest. Um, so we're at the moment, we're working with a company called Neon Tribe and we're developing a digital strategy to do just that because 
we <coughs> proudly launched Grant Lab last September, but then um, I realised that we weren't really collecting much information on different kinds of... I mean, we could get basic stats on who's using it and what kind of searches they're doing, but I think we realised we need to do that more strategically and collect that and then respond to it rather than just look at it and say, that's really interesting, the visitor numbers are up or down or, you know. So there is something for us there about um, making sure that we are seeing how people are using Beehive and GrantNav and our website and downloading data from the registry, the different journeys and how we collect that and then respond to it. It's, it's really interesting to see um, the kind of searches that people are doing on GrantNav. They, at the moment, actually, the really popular searches are the ones that are suggested the, suggest, the suggested searches on the examples were like, why is everyone looking at Bristol? And it was like, oh, well, because Bristol's one of the suggestions. So it's quite, you know, for us, there's some learning there as well. And we're also collecting some stuff on the, on the website. I don't know, Catherine, if you've got anything to add to that. Um, I mean, one of the things about GrantNav was making it as easy as possible to, for people to access, so not putting a login or any kind of barrier to getting in there. So what it, the trade-off is that you only have anonymous stats, so you get to see people's journeys, but you don't know, are you a grant maker, are you a grant seeker? And that's why we're now doing this extra research, going out to people, finding out, and then also um, developing tools uh, to help people use GrantNav. But Beehive as a tool, it, it, it's a, a model that logs in, and, and David, who's here, can maybe talk, but it, it, you know, it does have loads of stats. It's really, really looking at the, the stats of those kind of things. So that's another model um, that we can look at. Yeah, I mean, not to put you on the spot, David, but I know that Beehive, one thing I've discussed um, with the team, you and the team there, is um, can we develop a measure, for me, it would be really interesting, can we develop a measure that shows that users of Beehive um, are submitting more eligible applications to grant makers and reducing time wasted. And I think for us, that's a really great test if 360 data is useful. Is Beehive helping with that the kind of, I was talking about the online dating, you know, the matchmaking more efficiently so that we know that organisations that come to funders through Beehive giving are more targeted and, and we're looking to develop a measure. I don't know, David, if you want to talk about that. It's also fine if you don't. <laughs> um, well, well, there's, there's something we definitely like to, to kind of aspire to do. I don't think we're there yet. We're a bit the early, other, yeah. The other side of it is also um, for funders as well, To if they feel like they're getting a higher quality of applications, they're getting fewer ineligible applications, they're able to fund more exciting things, then, then that's something we'd really like to measure as well. Yeah, I think, I think to emphasise, I mean, it's early days. As we get more users, we do want to look at that. But for us, there is something really interesting about evidence around this being more, leading to more efficient and effective grant making. We have to make that jump from the open data to the, the changed behaviour. And that's the interesting bit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that talk. Really interesting. And I think uh, just speaking for myself as somebody who's been a charity trustee and seen the uh, like just how hard it is to find the yeah. appropriate grant of the sort of beehive angle on this sounds really exciting. Yeah. Um, another of my interests is in impact data. And I know that uh, in the process of applying for a grant, it'll be quite common to, to quantify uh, how much impact it's under some measure mm. um, you, you're expecting. And maybe also as part of the communications with your, with your grant provider to quantify how much has actually been achieved. Yeah. Um, is this within the scope of 360 giving? Yeah, impact data, it's always a... I think we've all probably written fundraising proposal was where you're asked to kind of say, yeah, but by 2020, we'll have got 80% of all UK grants <laughs> over it. You know, that's kind of... And how do we measure that? And did that actually have any impact? And so there is, there is that kind of... Yeah, there is that kind of how do you measure impact? And that is done in different ways by different organisations. So it's really tricky because sometimes that's qual qualitative and sometimes it's quantitative. I'm not sure if we mentioned this, we probably should have done if we didn't, that the schema that we've developed for the standard does allow you to add information items onto it. So if grant makers want to publish their monitoring and evaluation or their impact reports, they can do that. They can add a, a link to a website or their PDF reports or whatever it is. It's, we've made the schema very flexible so they can do that. My slight concern with that is that you just have loads of links to interesting m and &E reports and impact documents. I, I, I mean, the, the plus side is you get that all in one place. It's saving you going to 20 different websites. But there'd be no comparability necessarily across that because impact is measured in such different ways. So I suppose the answer is yes, yes, we're collecting, we're, we're potentially saying you can put m and &E and impact data in there if you want to. What we're not saying is it has to be standardised. <coughs> um, 
and I don't think that's a battle we're going to win if we try it. I think that's a whole other initiative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's my initiative. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Go for it. I think, I, think there's, I think there's a whole piece of work around how you measure impact of, of charitable funding um, and how you might look at common measures around mm. that. And if, if you want to look at a common, you know, a one place to get data set, we'd welcome a conversation. There's a whole piece of advocacy there around how you would you know measure some of this stuff in a meaningful way and how much of that is data versus anecdotal um, yeah but that is where one of the opportunities because we've got standardized grants data and we're encouraging people to use identifiers if it has a charity number a company number you can link that to other data sets maybe you can say something about the growth trends of organizations that have received grants and, and over time if there's enough data you could start to look at those patterns so it's not you know direct impact of grants but there's, there's some proxies that I think could be done and the kind of thing we maybe can start doing sooner rather than later because it's 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 there and then show the promise of it yeah I mean what what is potentially interesting there is that as a charity you know, we've got I've, we've got four different funders at 360 Giving. You can get all our grants. You can see all our grants on GrantNav because they've all published. Um, but we had to report to them in four different ways with um, different impact measures. Now I, I've I've made those measures similar because we're applying to them for the same kind of stuff. But I'm very aware that some charities might have a lot more funders than that and be reporting on lots of different measures. There could be an argument to, to say as well by by opening up this information charities would be more obliged to make sure they're telling the same story to their different funders because I think there's also an issue sometimes around you telling one funder that, you know one thing for a project and another thing and that's not necessarily dishonest or inaccurate it's just the, you're doing it in a slightly different way because of their requirements and actually there's an argument to be said all the information's here for all these different funders for this because you're all funding the same project and that is that is the measure and it's all in this one-stop shop so I, I, I would love to have a chat with you afterwards because I think there's an opportunity there around you can't standardise everything, but you can put information in one place for different audiences that are interested in the same thing. Hi, that was uh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, what's the most useful, practical way that people in this room and the wider community can support what you guys are doing? Um, what, what would, of all of these things, would you like people to promote and advocate for? Yeah. Um, what's, what's yeah. The, what a nice okay. practical question. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you are a trustee on a charity, for example, um, I would uh, be really interested to, to hear from your fund seekers, your fundraiser in your organisation, what they struggle with, how much time they spend on wasted applications, um, what would help them speed up that process. We'd love them to use Beehive Giving and give feedback on that. Um, we're very much in a learning process here. So, um, yeah, particularly interested to hear from fund seekers about their frustrations, why this information is useful for them, and to get them to tell us about it, but also to get their funders aware of it. Because for us, actually, it's quite compelling. You know, Catherine and I talk about this all the time, and of course we're going to say it's a good thing and that they should do it. But if they hear from their grantees... Actually, we're wait, you know, one in six of our applications is successful. I'm wasting a third of my time on applications that we're not eligible for, but we didn't know. I can't get feedback from them. That's taking away their time that they could be spent delivering the work that they're being funded for. And actually, you know, grant makers care about this as well because they need those organisations as much as you know, they, these organisations need the funding. It is a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think there's something about inefficiency around fundraising that grant makers would find quite compelling to hear about. And they are aware of this, a lot of them. You know, this is, they support us and, and they're aware of that. But I think other people saying it more often would be really helpful because obviously we're seen as coming with an agenda. Um, if anyone is involved with a grant-making organisation, open up your data. If you're, if you're worried about knock-on effects of that, come and have a chat with us. You know, the world hasn't fallen in yet for anyone. There is this fear of the kind of Daily Mail effect. <laughs> they're going to get negative publicity if we publish. That hasn't happened. Actually, you know, with a lot of goodwill, people are often just very interested in the data because it's interesting data, not because they want to try and catch you out and say, oh, you've been funding that organisation for 10 years, you know. And actually, our response to that is, yes, because they're doing really good work and all our information about our funding is here and we're proud of who we fund and this, it's, you know, it's all available. Be on the front foot with publishing your data. And then the third group, obviously, which I suspect is most likely here with, with this audience, 
your data users, use the data, tell us what else you'd like to see, um, does the schema work, what other tools and applications would be useful, keep an eye out for the challenge fund announcement, which will be coming towards the end of the year, get involved in the data use pilots. We see lots of different end users of the data, so we'd, we'd love people to, to play with it and tell us what they think. Yeah, we've got two. Um, one from Beck Strickland, who asks, how are the globally unique identifiers for organisations assigned and managed, especially for non-registered charities? Um, Catherine? Yes. <laughs> so um, basically there's a, there's a process. So it needs to be a unique identifier, but that would be the same for a single organisation. So if a, 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 a grant maker has funded an organisation more than once, it needs, to, it needs to be the same, so you can see multiple grants going to a single organisation. If that organisation is registered, there is a registry and it's an external one, like it has a charity number, a company number, there are edgy base numbers for educational establishments. These, there are various lists around the world that you can refer to. Um, then we encourage people to use that and we have prefixes which help computers, machines to understand that this string of seven numbers is a charity in England and Wales rather than a Scottish charity or one based in Northern Ireland. But obviously not all organisations have those, they might not have collected them and some organisations are unregistered, there is no identifier. So then we work with them, do you have an internal system identifier, a string of numbers that your database has, uh, use that. If you don't, then you can make them out of uh, names. So some, if you look in grant nav, some of those identifiers are a string of names. So basically, it's it's just going through a kind of almost like a decision tree. If you've got this, then do that, and that you go down. Um, and for some organisations, it's prompted them to think about how how we can collect this data, which they might be using for due diligence. You know, absolutely looking at charity accounts, but not necessarily putting a number into a database. You know, it's not data. So we definitely say start where you can, um, publish what you can. Don't get too caught up on going back and collecting data that you didn't have. But what can you do going forward? So um, we're part of a um, joined up uh, org ID identifying campaign globally aren't we? yeah we're supporting um, an organization identifier project which is essentially a list of lists so it's kind of trying to get the list of lists of all organization identifiers globally starting off with things like you know in the UK we know we've got companies house and the charities commission registers and there are lots of those all over the world and wouldn't it be great if you could find all that in one place so we're supporting that initiative as, as well yeah got one more online uh, from Rory Scott who asks um, what has been the best way to promote and measure the use of 360 giving data so far? That's a good question. Um, the best way to promote it has been through platforms like Beehive and GrantNav. People generally don't like raw data sets. Um, uh, people don't want to look at the, I mean, some people will look at the Excel spreadsheets, but most people want a front end on the data, and that for us really helped. Um, show potential around um, what you could use the data for. As I, I mentioned earlier about show, don't tell, people suddenly realised why we were banging on about organisation identifiers and collecting things like charity and company numbers. That for us really shot up the, the use of the data. Yeah. In terms of concrete measures, that's something we're looking at over the course of this year linked to these data use pilots and the challenge fund about how else we could measure use and, and, and impact and change behaviour from using the data. But at the moment, it's really about um, letting people access it more easily has really been the, the, big, the big jump for us in terms of getting people to use it and awareness. Hi, I wanted to pick up on your comments about um, organizations' use of data. We, used, we were talking about uh, they know they want to use more data, but struggle how to yeah. do that well and also other people are sort of sticking some of this into maps and maybe that's not the best way of data presentation yeah. so I'm just wondering what else you've learned about charitable organizations challenges when it comes to using data yeah yeah that's really been a key learning for us um, I think originally you know the founders of 360 giving they're both philanthropists Fran and Will Perrin and they run the Indigo Trust which is one of the 18 Sainsbury's family charitable trusts so it's a big kind of philanthropic history there with the Sainsbury's family and I think originally Fran and Will were expecting quite a lot of 
pushback on the initiative and, and we're pleasantly surprised that lots of grant makers have been really welcoming of what we're doing um, and they get in principle why it would be good to share their data and and want to know more and, and who, el who else is funding what where for what they support but when you ask them specifically what they want to do they really struggle to to answer that and quite frequently the answer is we'd love to have a map of who else is funding this in this county or central region uh, and we'd love to map it across indices of deprivation so we could see cold spots and whilst I'm open to that and I love maps and I love what Bath Hacked did um, my concern is you'd have lots of nice maps and it doesn't lead to changed behaviour because actually there could be a very valid reason for that cold spot because there are no organisations there um, or there's a danger that everyone dives in to these areas of deprivation and actually next door is suffering as a result and they're just a few you know dots up on the index and I, th I think I think it's something about um, actually there's a role for the ODI and others here around capa capacity building around data use and and I think for us it's there's a danger that we get conflated with Grant Nav and Beehive, which are just two platforms which we're using to demonstrate uses of the data. But there's a danger that people say, well, we tried to use Beehive or we tried to use Grant Nav and it didn't work for us. So 360 Giving doesn't work for us. And actually, we need to show that we're just about putting the raw data out there and there are different end users and different platforms and tools that you can build. And, and that you, you know, Grant Nav isn't the only thing and Beehive isn't the only thing if you're a fund seeker that you can use and, and we need to demonstrate um, that there are myriad uses but I think as part of that we need to build capacity building into it and and get beyond a conversation that's just about visualising mm -hmm. maps. Do you have anything to add to that Catherine? Um, I mean there's something about the, the going through the publishing process in terms of you know often uh, you know, it can be quite hands-on where we're giving lots of support or they could be quite <coughs> independent, but that often there's a payoff from having done it, you know, in terms of getting to know data, cleaning the data, maybe adding in um, geography and things like that, and then at the end of it saying, oh, it's actually, it was a level of work to do it, but now we can use it for our own internal use. That, that publish wants use often, you're kind of um, getting people to use it internally. So I think there is a sense that um, people's uh, capacity to, to think in terms of data does get enlivened by doing this. It's just yeah. it's then having external drivers to say, and then you'll do it again and again, and you might add to it, and then you might get involved with different yeah. kinds of partners. And this is all very new to many of these organisations yeah. who, yes, as Rachel said, don't necessarily have much in-house tech or data capacity. So yeah, is it up to us to kind of seed the ground and create yeah. opportunities for people to discover that there's something they want they're to do? They're not low on enthusiasm, no. but I think that, I think there is something about um, getting beyond maps and showing potential around different types and of users. And that's the charity sector in general. That's you know like every, and, and local authorities yeah. and places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, th I think that's why with the challenge fund we hope to inspire that a bit more and just and just make sure we're not conflated too much with just two platforms that maybe don't work for them and what else they can do. I suppose just picking up yeah. quickly on Catherine's point as well about. The publishing process has always also been really interesting because what we've found is that organisations as part of that have had to review their internal systems and they're realising, so they say they want to use data more but they're realising that they might not be collecting certain information items or that they haven't thought much about data protection um, or they're not clear on, on licensing. So there's also publishing to 360 giving becomes a bigger process of review about internal information management which I don't think we initially expected and it's been really interesting. It has also meant that some organisations have taken a year to publish because they've done a whole review of their information management systems. But as part of that, I've ended up talking about digital strategy, data use, data sharing. And so it becomes a much bigger exercise, which is really interesting. So it's, there's something about, about that that I think we probably need to get better at thinking about guidance there on, on the kind of beyond just publishing publicly. I was just wondering on the other side of data publishing, have you been talking to any big grant recipients about opening up all of the data that on what and where they're receiving data from to start to map other sources that you're unaware of and how the two can link together? Yeah, the answer to that is no, but I can say, have you got yeah, more? No, I, I, we, no we haven't. Yeah, no, not not, not no, the no, no, we don't no, want no, to. No, no, we haven't, but I, I do remember... Uh, when we were launching Grant Nav, someone in the room was like, can we get our data on oh, yeah. here? And they were a recipient, I can we kind of publish that? And, and in a way... We uh, said no, I think. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, in, in a way, it's, it's the kind of thing we have to think it through. It's got those two different sides. Um, it, it, 
Well, there's double, d double counting issue, isn't there? Yeah, well, double counting is a big issue anyway because there are re-granters and uh, certainly there's definitely an opportunity to see, you know, one grant maker gives to another grant maker which then comes out, especially community foundations, um, you know, how you see that money flowing through and that's something we're, we're alive to. But yeah, um, often with these conversations, the answer is it depends. People say, can we do such and such? And like, it depends. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. And we, Get case studies. There together. is some, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing. Are you asking because in the context of follow the money, kind of seeing it going down, down through the money chain, is that? Um, in the context of follow the money, and in the context of, would it help you in discovering more and other grants? Yeah. Because if someone publishes 40 million, 80 million pounds worth of grants received yeah. from all sorts of different sources, you it gives you a route to seeing whether those people, local authorities, other charities, yeah. foundations, can then publish the data as well. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that that is the double counting issue. So a good example, given it's Comet Relief Day today, isn't yeah, it? Red yeah, Nose um, Red Nose Day. So Comet Relief give a grant to the Indigo Trust to an organisation. So there's a re-granting there. Both Comic and Indigo have published that data. That's double counted. Now we're not saying that's a problem. We just need to somehow flag that that grant is also registered there and going there. So there is something about kind of following that through and how we'd flag that. So it's not an out and out no, we don't want it to happen. I think we do, but it's how we, I think at the moment we're starting with the people with the cash who are kind of sending it down. But I think there is something about a particular large charity that might do some re-granting, how, but might doesn't see themselves as a grant maker primarily, but a facilitator, how we might flag that in a way that's useful to yeah to see it through and uh, we're increasingly getting questions about you know pro bono in kind non-financial you know people are excited by the idea of being able to share and track transactions and then you know how could we convey other types of information so again that's something where it's like it's, it's, it would be interesting to explore it in a real case and see how it comes out what it looks like yeah I think there's also an argument for the Charity Commission asking for more um, detailed annual reports. So at the moment, I think you're not obliged to report to them on every single grant make made. Um, and if, I think if that were to go digital, you could potentially just suck that data from the Charity Commission and, and, and use that as well to kind of help fill that gap. just going to sort of respond on that and the uh, so in my last job at NCVO as a researcher uh, accounts data was was the real kind of holy grail f for that stuff and for getting the the other side of the picture and it's all locked up in pdfs and they're you know uh, with well, the usual sort of pdf thing they're written as documents that you read not as data and actually there's a lot of of data in there so I think there's a sort of parallel process that needs to happen of moving towards electronic accounts and uh, and lots of funders specify that you have to put in the accounts when you get a, a, a grant from them anyway. So, yeah. so that data does does exist. It's just sort of locked up. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a whole other initiative. But kind of opening up that data, I think, would be really useful as well. And I think there is an appetite at the Charity Commission uh, mm. to, to look at this. Um, and it's just how they m move gradually, given that charities vary so much in size in the UK. But, you know, a lot of... Trusts and foundations are registered charities, so you could argue you could start off with with them or the, or the larger charities, <coughs> and then and you know there'd be a transition process. But I do think there's an appetite at the charity commission to do that, and they have been running a consultation recently on a digital strategy. So I'd encourage people to feed into that and, and tell them why PDFs aren't really working at the moment. And I, I think to be fair to them, they are aware of that. It's just how you know what next and how they roll that out. Thank you. Thank you. Really enlightening talk, um, giving us lots of food for thought, and I'm sure that you'll be happy to stick around for a little bit if Absolutely. people are yeah. interested in having a further conversation. So next week we have, um, who do we have? Lucy we Knight. Lucy Knight from ODI Devon, who's a, one of our nodes. She works at Devon County Council, and she'll be talking about how they've got to grips with open data, um, the tools that have worked, the sort of cheap and free versions of things that have helped, and challenges that they've faced, and how they're overcoming them. I think we're going to come to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks.